John, and, and for the uh, opportunity and privilege to be able to present um, my relevant disclosures. So a little bit of background. Why are we interested in vaccines as treatments for cancer? And you've heard some of this earlier today, but just to kind of set the stage. So we already know that the tumor is, or the immune system is involved in tumor surveillance. So this was suspected for about 100 years, but there's actually now experimental evidence that this happens. We also know that having the right kind of T cells in the tumor microenvironment is prognostic and associated with a better long-term outcome. And perhaps the best data is in colorectal cancer, but it's coming through in a number of diseases. And in particular, having CD8 T cells and interferon gamma secreting cells in the tumor microenvironment is associated with a better outcome. So it stands to reason that the ability of, T or of uh, vaccines or T cell activating therapies to specifically augment these populations should be a benefit, in particular, if we can drive these cells into the tumor microenvironment. And also, arguably, the greatest medical accomplishment of the last century was the development of uh, infectious disease vaccines that could eradicate diseases. Um, some would argue antibiotics, but antibiotics have created drug-resistant organisms rather than vaccines that were able to actually eradicate them. So our hope for the next century is to, uh, is to take anti-tumor vaccines in this direction. Um, there's also experimental data in animals and human data that they actually work, and even a single agents actually work. Um, and also given the safety uh, that has been observed with multiple agents to date, they're well positioned to combine with other immune active therapies, whether immune, um, immune modulating therapies or other standard uh, uh, anti-tumor therapies. So the rub is why after about 100 years of anti-tumor vaccines do we have pretty little to show for it actually? And the first is that tumors have already arisen in, the, in, an, um, in, a, in an immune environment and so have already escaped immune surveillance. Um, second, we already ha there, there's a lot of question about what are the right targets for vaccines, and this is a debate that's still going on whether they should be self-antigens, shared antigens, tumor-specific antigens, viral antigens, or mutated personalized specific antigens for every single patient. And ultimately, optimally therapeutic vaccines will likely require combination approaches targeting multiple mechanisms of resistance. Notwithstanding, we do have some evidence that they work as single agents, and actually the best example comes in the case of prostate cancer, and as you all know, we have an, an FDA-approved vaccine. It was approved in 2010 on the basis of overall survival, uh, Cipolisil T. And in addition, similar findings were found with the PROSVAC vaccine. This was um, the secondary endpoint from a phase two trial um, that, that also showed an overall survival benefit. However, for both trials, or um, the uh, time to so I'm not sure. Oh, the time to progression endpoints were not met. This was the primary endpoint of the randomized phase two trial in PROSVAC, and this was a, a previous phase three trial for PROVENGE. So this has raised a lot of questions. Why is there no association between time to progression and overall survival? We count on this as medical oncologists. And how do we monitor the effects of these if we can't really rely on standard imaging endpoints? And can we identify patients who are likely to respond or not, given the cost of these agents? And are there simpler and frankly cheaper means to immunize? And are we really evaluating these therapies in the appropriate populations? So what we know from a number of animal studies and from a number of human studies as well, that, um, that anti-tumor vaccines may sort of take time to work or they may be most optimal in the settings of minimal residual disease. And this has been modeled by Tito Fojo and Robbie Modin at the NCI Cancer Institute, where they looked at sort of the effects of, or looked at how tumors grow with respect to the disease growth rates uh, from standard cytotoxic therapies um, conducted in clinical trials versus vaccines, and they're really focused on PROSVAC. And what they found is that, um, in general, you can model this, that if this is a chemotherapy agent, if you give your agent at this inflection point treat, disease shrinks, but then grows again at basically the same rate once you stop the therapy. And this can provide a time to uh, disease progression and increase in time to progression, and also an improvement in survival. But if you try to model um, what was done with PROSVAC, because you see something different, and that is that the tumors grow slower, and this could then explain why we see a change in uh, uh, overall survival, but not change in time to progression. And this is actually what we see in multiple anti-tumor uh, preclinical models as well, is that things just grow a little bit slower. Um, so if this is the case, then really what we should be doing is using these therapies earlier in the course of disease with lower tumor burden. So this is very similar, and this applies to multiple areas of life. I mean, my financial advisor tells me that if this is college education, I should have been doing it back here, saving for college rather than here, right when they're about to head off to college. <clears throat> so um, this is the, this is the uh, you've seen this slide multiple times today, what we call the clinical states model for prostate cancer. But if you stretch this out on a time scale, this is really kind of what we see. Uh, there are always, of course, exceptions. 
Um, but if this is sort of curative disease or curable disease and a recurrent disease, we have about a median of about eight years before um, the first detection of uh, residual disease will show up as metastases. And as you know, we treat this uh, recurrent disease usually with androgen deprivation therapy. And if you look at the number of approvals that we've had over the last decade, they've all been in patients with very advanced disease with um, survival measured in terms of months rather than many years. So we think that this is an optimal, uh, optimal setting actually to be uh, looking at vaccines in the setting of minimal residual disease where we have perhaps this time to work. And this is where we've been kind of focused our, our, our efforts. So what about the target for vaccines and what is the best antigen for a vaccine? So tumor vaccines have been kind of classified even since the uh, 1970s of, uh, by a, a few kind of criteria. We could be looking at tumor specific proteins or, or antigens that are expressed only by the tumor or perhaps mutated frame shift translocation events or things that may be more specific for the tumor or perhaps more associated with the tumor and overexpressed in tumors like HER2 nu or things that might drive the oncogenic uh, uh, pathway or oncofetal differentiation antigens. In particular, a lot of interest in cancer testis antigens that are proteins expressed by germ cells that don't express MHC class one and their aberrant expression in tumors makes them essentially tumor specific targets. Viral oncogenes, and you heard earlier from um, the folks at Inovio about targeting um, the, the drivers uh, oncog uh, oncogenes in the setting of uh, premalignant cervical cancer. And right now there's a lot of enthusiasm for unique patient-specific mutant proteins or epitopes, what we call personalized epitopes as opposed to shared or shared personalized antigens versus shared antigens. And I'll focus the rest on really shared antigens. So in 2009, um, Mac Cheever and groups at the, uh, uh, group at the NCI sort of polled the community and did a, a consensus review of what are the sort of uh, optimal features of best targets for vaccines. And they came up with this list. Um, Perhaps not surprisingly, if you have evidence that they actually work, that's the best thing to take a look at. But the next best thing to take a look at was, do they elicit an immune response in vivo? And are they really involved in the oncogenic pathway so that tumors, if you target them, they can't really do without them? <clears throat> so in the case of prostate cancer, we took a little bit of a step back about 15 years ago and asked whether there were proteins that were immunologically recognized. And we used a method called CIREX, um, which had been developed in which we um, could take uh, phage cDNA um, and uh, transfect bacteria, encode them, uh, or transfer, uh, uh, plate them on a lawn on, a, on, on plates, transfer to a nitrocellulose membrane, and then probe, sort of like a Western blot. This is kind of what you see, these immunoreactive plaques that you can sequence and identify immunoreactive proteins. And over a number of years, we um, looked in patients with uh, prostatitis, patients with prostate cancer that had, had been treated with immune modulating therapies, patients after androgen deprivation itself, and identified a number of um, a number of antigens that we then screened with patients with different stages of disease or prostatitis alone or just normal uh, male controls. And boiling this down to a, a list that was more highly specific, what we ended up finding was there wasn't a specific protein that was most uh, recognized in the majority of patients. So it's a little bit different than the thyroid, for example, which autoimmune thyroiditis tends to pick out a few targets. And that's what we were looking for in prostate cancer. And we didn't find that. So how do we pick targets for anti-tumor vaccines if there isn't one that just stands out? So going back to the list, um, in the case of prostate cancer, not only do we need to look, or can we take a look at tumor specific, we can look at tissue specific antigens as the prostate's an expendable organ, unlike the kidney or something like that that you can't do without. <clears throat> so we first took a look at the most commonly, the high, was two of the highest transcripts of the prostate, PSA and PAP or prostatic acid phosphatase, and found this is looking at uh, T cell responses um, to these individual antigens in patients without cancer versus early stage or later stage prostate cancer, and found that they're, they're both recognized, in, at least in some patients. And based on this, we, we looked at mostly at prostatic acid phosphatase and chose that as an antigen for study for a few reasons. Based on that data, but also that it's essentially restricted to the prostate tissue in humans. There was also a rat homolog, so we were able to model things in rats. Um, also targeting PAP left PSA alone as a target, as an independent assessment in human trials. And there were others also taking a look at it. And PAP is actually the target of the Provengercipolis T vaccine. So um, the approach we took was taking a look at genetic vaccines by viral and DNA delivery. Uh, DNA like virus can enter uh, antigen presenting cells. 
uh, encoded proteins can enter the, MH, uh, the endogenous MHC class one presentation pathway and favor the production of antigen specific T cells and CTL in particular CD8 T cells. So to summarize about uh, 10 years of work, we've uh, have, uh, studied in animals and into human trials, the DNA vaccine encoding prostatic acid phosphatase, conducted a phase one trial looking at safety and immunogenicity and found we could elicit immune responses with no safety issues. Um, completed a separate trial looking at uh, scheduling and dosing over two years with real-time immune monitoring to characterize the character of the immune response elicited. And on the basis of these trials, we're con currently conducting two trials in combination, um, either with Cipolucil T or with anti-PD-1. Um, and actually, to your reason, because we found that immunization elicits PD-L1 on circulating tumor cells um, after immunization. So uh, we're actually conducting these trials in patients with metastatic disease. Um, we're also conducting a randomized phase two clinical trial in Emmanuel and Tanarakis's uh, PI at Hopkins and Larry Fong at UCSF and our center, um, looking at uh, two-year metastasis-free survival in patients with biochemically recurrent disease. So, but what about other antigens? And looking back at our, at our list, we asked, if we had to pick another target that might be appropriate and maybe tumor associated, highly expressed in tumor and essential to the development of prostate cancer, uh, we picked one um, and that was the androgen receptor. So you've heard a lot about the androgen receptor today as a pharmacological target, but probably most people haven't thought of it as an immunological target. But we know that, that the AR um, is plays an important role and is active, overexpressed, and or mutated in at least 50% of castrate resistant uh, tumors, and also that the high expression associates with poor prognosis. We were particularly interested in the ligand binding domain, uh, the C-terminal portion, uh, because it's completely identical in amino acid sequence among multiple species, including mice, rats, and humans. So we had our preclinical models in humans so we could test the same vaccine and not worry about uh, xenogene xenogeneic differences. So Brian Olson, who's here and will present um, on Sunday, identified a number of years ago that people with prostate cancer tend to have antibody responses or can have antibody responses irrespective of stage of disease, and that these patients also have T-cell responses to um, the androgen receptor ligand binding domain that we can detect. So again, sort of evidence that it's, it can be immunologically recognized even in patients with cancer. And also by generating a DNA vaccine encoding the androgen receptor, we could immunize mice. Uh, these are HLA-A2 transgenic mice that uh, develop um, C CD8 T cell responses to epitopes that we had identified in humans as well. And furthermore, um, if we immunized uh, tramp mice that are again expressing the androgen receptor in the tumors, uh, animals immunized with the vaccine compared with a control vaccine um, live longer. So this was an actual survival study in mice. So asking the question about targets and timing, when would you pick the time to actually take a look at targeting the androgen receptor as an immunological target? Or we also take advantage of a particular property of this antigen, and that is that androgen deprivation, we know in humans, um, can increase expression of the androgen receptor. And we can demonstrate this in cell lines as well, that uh, cell lines either at the mRNA level or at the protein level um, under androgen prive conditions, prostate tumor lines will increase expression of the androgen receptor. And so this provides kind of a model that perhaps the best time to immunize is after androgen deprivation. If tumor volume is large and we begin androgen deprivation therapy, we can basically debulk the tumor. Um, our sort of our minimal residual disease state, again, if you will, begin immunization and hypothetically then sort of target cells that are overexpressing the androgen receptor to hopefully delay the time to recurrence or castration resistance. So, and Brian will present data that we think this is happening in mice as well, um, but we're testing it now in a phase one trial um, as well. So this will, a phase one trial that we've just opened, really looking at the safety and immunogenicity, but testing it in the same population. So what about other possible target antigens? So we've had a lot of interest in um, possibly the cancer testis antigens as well, and in particular protein called SSX2, which we found was uh, immunologically recognized um, in patients. In fact, it's um, highly abundant. CD8 T cells are, are, are abundant in patients with metastatic uh, disease. And we also found that it's not expressed in uh, primary tumors, but is expressed in about 20 to 25% of metastatic tumors. Um, we're um, studying the biology of this protein and found that it's likely involved in the EMT stem cell phenotype 
And so um, really looking at developing this as, a, as an antigen that we may immunize to prevent the development of metastases or, probably, or ideally target it before the development of metastases. So um, just to summarize, um, vaccines have uh, demonstrable clinical activity in patients with advanced prostate cancer. The optimal timing um, for anti-tumor vaccines as monotherapies, we believe, is probably in patients with earlier stages of disease. Um, optimal target antigens really remain unknown. Um, however, ultimately, and I didn't really highlight this, but several antigens are probably necessary to avoid antigen loss, and one of the reasons why we're interested in looking at multiple targets. Plasma DNA vaccines elicit antigen-specific Th1 bias CD8 T cells in patients with prostate cancer. And as such, we think that this is a platform to be able to test the immunogenicity of different antigens. And that's where we really started about 10 years ago. It's taken a while to kind of get there, but to be able to use the same platform to be able to ask whether one antigen might be better than another, something we really don't know. And ultimately, we believe that vaccines will have their greatest effect in combination approaches with either immune modulating agents, with immune modulating agents, whether it's androgen deprivation uh, agents like checkpoint inhibitors or other standard uh, anti-tumor agents. So with that, I will acknowledge all of the people in my lab who've done this uh, work, our clinical research team and our funding sources, and happy to answer any questions. Questions for Doug? I'll ask you a quick one while uh, John's coming sure. to the microphone. So um, what, what's your thought, given Cipulosil and its uh, mm -hmm. regulatory approval and mm -hmm. what we're seeing in other solid tumors and checkpoint inhibitors and the responses that they're having, what do you think is the best sort of regulatory strategy, endpoint strategy that we should think about for vaccines, given the novel mechanisms of action that we're seeing? No, it's a it's a great question. I, I I'm not entirely sure is is uh, is the fair answer. Um, our our model for developing agents has been you need to show single agent activity, and I think it's a high bar in patients with very advanced disease for vaccines. I think they're best evaluated in an earlier stage of disease. We've been plagued ourselves with evaluating things in stage D0 and D0.5, that those are very long endpoints to reach. Um, so, but we have, but it, I think it's also equally important to develop measurable agents, meaning that we, do, we deliver a vaccine, we need to be able to sh be sure what we're able to do is measure it so that when we do combine it, we can ask the, the effect of uh, that other agent on it. So that's been kind of our development approach of looking at things with early stage disease um, to really answer those those questions, um, but then in combination studies, you know, maybe maybe it's fine to be taking a look in people with more advanced disease, like a titer or something like that, to Correct. show what what would be the effect of your vaccine that you could follow I, through the life of the patient. Yep, I think also I I'm I'm, I'm very keen to to take a look at the neoadjuvant setting because I think that's an opportunity where we can immunize or even um, in um, active surveillance uh, where we may be able to get biopsies and be able to take a look at what's going on in the tumor microenvironment. John. Yeah. Have you have you measured any T memory cells in any of your models, mm -hmm. and are you inducing the T memory too? Yes. Um, so um, we've looked at that kind of from a number of uh, cases. Uh, so how you define T memory is is and one it's a issue. Small population. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So we can take a look at that either by surface markers, whether they're expressing um, uh, CD45 RO, and yes, we see them, or whether we see a, a response to challenge by um, uh, antigen-specific proliferation, and um, yes to all of those. Um, yeah. um, Brian Olson did a very careful analysis on a study we conducted over two years where we looked at the profile of those cells as well by um, whether they were multifunctional, secreting one or more Th1-based cytokines. And what we found is that, um, that we would see an expansion of the population of antigen-specific cells shortly there or shortly after immunization. And while it contracts over time, the percentages of those cells that are multifunctional remain similar over time. Because yeah. it, it brings <clears throat> you back to your initial design where you would, mm -hmm. you would say it is where you maybe give ADT and then you hit it. Mm -hmm you know, there and try to prolong. Mm -hmm. it, it also seems that would be a, a nice design where then if you start to see some progression, that's when you bring in your PDL1, PD1, PDL1 inhibitor because mm -hmm. that may be the, the case where you still have the memory cells, but you then just need maybe a boost plus <clears throat> something that will turn off the, the break, so to speak. Correct. Actually, uh, um, it's a pilot trial that we're conducting right now where we're ask, asking that question, actually, um, because we don't know the right timing for this. So we're asking the question whether 
vaccine um, concurrent with PD-1 blockade or sequential, where we give vaccine first, try to elicit that response, and then followed by PD-1 after. So hopefully be able to tell you in a couple of years. Yes, John. I'm a little confused about immunology. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. So Think I'm, of it as circulating <laughs> neurons. Well, but, but I'm 66, and I know my thymus doesn't work anymore. So mm -hmm. if you were to vaccinate me, mm -hmm. what would I have to use in order for my vaccine to take? Because you're not, it's not like a young person who has their thymus and can process. So is it, and, and we usually think of it in an elderly person, mm -hmm. that it's essentially recall antigens in memory. Mm -hmm. So my question is, it seems like we're vaccinating at the wrong time. So if you think that mm -hmm. a population is at risk, wouldn't you want to be vaccinating at about like 30 years of age? No, let the man have their child, start vaccinating him, start getting some autoimmune reactions to the prostate to slow down the progression of histological prostate cancer to clinical. Because it seems like we're starting now. We, we got to be we got to be basically taking advantage of whatever T cell repertoire we've already got. We can modulate it a bit. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the aging mm -hmm. issue, most of the men we're talking about, aren't they going to be when their thymus isn't going to be terribly helpful? Well, interestingly, what happens after androgen deprivation is you actually get a regrowth of the thymus. And, and we've shown that you actually get an increase in the number of naive T cells that are being put out. So one thought has been actually that maybe we've gotten lucky with anti-tumor vaccines and the setting of castration-resistant disease because these are all castrated individuals who have maybe more, more naive T cells. So that, that's one point. I, but I, um, one can still vaccinate, one can still immunize. <clears throat> one thing we, we think probably happens though, is that in the course of tumor development, I, I, I showed you that you, you get T cells that are auto-reactive, um, but they're being suppressed. And so maybe it's that we're not generating something from nothing. It's that we're, act we're activating the cells that are already there that are just kind of being kept at bay in that tolerance setting. What I can't understand is now with haplotransplants, mm -hmm. wh why we wouldn't take advantage. I mean, they're basically easy to do when a person doesn't have cancer. Why we wouldn't take somebody like and get their their ch child's basically T cells, their you know twenty year old T cells, not, not seventy year old mm -hmm. T cells, and and try to do it that way. In other words, I'm still thinking that what we haven't really captured here is we haven't really reinvigorated the immune system. We're trying to take advantage, which mm -hmm. it's been seeing the cancer, and particularly what really struck me was you're you're picking antigens that I know I'm shedding. Right now. I mean, I'm shedding mm -hmm. ones for PSA and for acid phosphatase. I mean, Dr. Liao, that's how he was going to clone the antigen receptor. He actually took serum from men to show that they had autoantibodies to the antigen receptor. Because mm -hmm. everybody in this room has got antibodies to the antigen receptor floating around. Mm -hmm. So the question yeah, is the titer. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I'm, I'm just thinking, thinking a little bit more out of the box. If we had somebody that was really, I mean, what about bone marrow transplant to kind of, with the vaccine? Um, that's actually an idea that I, I remember talking with Reiner Store probably 20 years ago about, about that idea. And imagine the regulatory hurdles of, of vaccinating the donor and doing a mini transplant in, in men in their uh, late 60s, early 70s. So it's not insurmountable, but um, uh, um, the, there's certainly other approaches. Um, So there are groups that are looking at adoptive T cell uh, adoptive approaches where you basically do similar kind of approach where you take the cells out of the body, activate them in vitro, and infuse them back. The, the challenges are still the same. It's about regulation once they're back in. So we can get these cells, but they're not always necessarily doing a lot of killing. So that's why that's why I come back to, um, in addition to vaccines, which are sort of driving. Um, driving the, the direction of the immune response, if you will, we probably need inhibitors of those, res of those resistance pathways. And then probably something also that's gonna work in the tumor microenvironment to allow those cells to get there and be activated and, per and persist. And, and uh, uh, so that's why ultimately it's, it's, it's combination therapies and we're kind of, what I'm describing is really one part of that puzzle. Great discussion. Thanks. And